go. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the third day of the 16th Symposium of Irish Studies in South America. My name is Rosario, and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Burgos in Spain. Uh, let me introduce you to our speaker. Maria Mor Barros del Rio is a senior lecturer at the University of Burgos, Spain, where she teaches English, language, culture, and literature. Her research focuses mainly on gender studies and contemporary Irish fiction. Other fields of interest are critical pedagogy and second language teaching for which she was funded the Erasmus Plus Verteach project from 2018 to 2021. She has been a visiting researcher at UCD Ireland and Victoria University Canada. She has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals and collective volumes. And she is the author of A Practical Guide to Address Gender Bias in Academia and Research in 2016, El Trabajo de las Mujeres Pobres in 2010, and Metáforas de su Tierra, Breve Historia de las Mujeres Irlandesas in 2004. She is Secretary of AEDE, Asociación Española de Estudios Irlandeses, and a member of the Center for Irish Studies, Banabond. In June 2022, she will host the 20th AEDE International Conference in Burgos. Amor will deliver the lecture entitled Irish Women's Narratives and the Building of the Nation from Edna O'Brien to Sally Rooney. Amor, the floor is yours. Thank you, dear Rosario. Thank you very much for your kind presentation. Bon dia. Good morning, everybody. I am honored to be part of this wonderful event and delighted with the bonds established across the ocean between IDE and ABE. Uh, I would also like to thank the, the, the organizers of this amazing uh, event uh, because uh, it, it's been very enriching and uh, because of the quality of the presentations that we are uh, attending these days. As uh, Rosario said, my talk is entitled Irish Women's Narratives and the Building of the Nation from Edna Ryan to Sally Rooney. And I will try to be as clear and uh, didactic as possible. For that, I'm trying to, uh, I will share my screen with a uh, presentation. There we are. No, yeah, okay, there we are. Um, it is commonly said that history is written by the victors and Irish history is no exception. In 1921, the signature of the Anglo-Irish Treaty meant the start of a new path for Ireland. I have always pictured literature as a privileged site for interpretation of society. In my view, literature is an artistic form of expression that inevitably reflects social changes, but also longings and desires discomfort and defiance. Also literary forms speak of a country's mind, um, their way of reading reality and uh, the way they express their hopes. Today we will review some historic and literary landmarks to assess the building of the Irish nation through the hands of two women writers, Edna Bryan and Sally Rooney. Separated by a span of 60 years, both writers have used the coming of age novel to portray the problematic process of emancipation undertaken by youth in Ireland. We know that in less than a century, Ireland has transitioned from a self-sufficient and protectionist state to the international power it is today. So in what follows, I will attempt to review Irish history through a gender lens and draw a parallel between the building of the nation and the use of the novel of formation to assess O'Brien and Rooney's works 
and their literary achievements in the writing of emancipatory processes. During the decades following the Civil War, the government of Ireland devoted itself to reconstructing a nation that had been a colony for several centuries. Aided by a protectionist national policy, the state cultivated its own rigid and uncompromising version of Republican womanhood, based on a self-sacrificing attitude that would put the good of the nation above any personal desire. That political, economic, and ideological process served to revive the old concept of Mother Ireland, which took a new shape under, dicta under the dictates of the state and the Catholic Church. Thus, in the central decades of the 20th century, a tough legal and moral control over the Irish population was founded on traditional patriarchal values. A series of laws designed to seclude women and mothers in the home were passed in the 1920s and 30s. Consequently, the vast majority of the married women were economically dependent on their husbands, a circumstance that inevitably had an impact on their personal autonomy and agency. Family and household structures and employment and welfare policies were firmly supported in the 1937 Constitution, most particularly uh, through sections one and two of Article 41. And at the same time, all sorts of violent behavior were secluded within the walls of the home and socially perceived as just domestic affairs. Legal attention to this matter had to wait until 1996 when the Domestic Violence Act was passed. But in general, the roles assigned to the Irish women from the 1930s onwards were passive and lacking independence. In her review of women's Irish fiction between 1922 and 1960, Geraldine Minnie has affirmed that, and I quote, political history shaped even apparently domestic fictions, end of quote. And it was in this repressive atmosphere that Edna Bryan was raised. Born in 1930, this country girl would become one of the great creative writers of her generation, according to former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson. Her extensive and awarded literary career has the country girl's trilogy as a focal point. Indeed, the three novels in the epilogue tell the female experience of childhood and subsequent entry into the adult world in an ongoing exodus from country to city, first Dublin and then London. Uh, the Country Girls, published in 1960, immediately became a scandal and was banned in Ireland, uh, as you probably know. Its sequels, The Lonely Girl and uh, Girls in, in the Married Please, uh, found an epilogue that was added in 1986, and all of them expose unspoken aspects of Irish women's lives, such as family violence, female sexuality, love out of wedlock, the strife for female emancipation, the darkest aspects of marriage, and in some, the utter deception underlying the national trope of Irish womanhood. Eike de Hocker has recognized the trilogy as an important testimony to socio-political realities in 20th century Ireland. With a strong autobiographical component and a great deal of courage, of course, O'Brien innovated from a formal perspective. In the trilogy, subjectivity, authority, and agency become a focal point. And this was achieved by an innovative use of the building form. Although Irish literature had already spawned works on growth and maturity, uh, of course, we, we must refer to a portrait of the artist as young man, or um, uh, the female version displayed by Kate O'Brien and Yolanda Spices. In my opinion, the Country Girls trilogy epitomizes an innovative formulation of the feminine building roman in Ireland. Indeed, this trilogy is a work whose formal innovation derives from the impossibility of the female characters 
to follow the same stages of development as the male character within the traditional structure of the male Bildungsromance genre. Hence, in a context where a strong Catholic nationalism circumscribed female behavior to domestic chores and maternity, O'Brien's trilogy incorporates a discourse of resistance that emphasizes the disenchantment, frustration, and the rejection of that female model. Here, the emancipatory journey manifests itself in a progressive physical and emotional detachment. It defies traditional values and makes the structural limitations of the emancipatory process evident as far as female characters are concerned. To overcome these constraints, structural alteration of the linear progression of the traditional Bildungsroman is requested, particularly in the third book and the epilogue, which show an increasing use of temporal leaps and narrative voices. At this point, it is particularly interesting the introduction of the second narrator in the third book, which allows the use of different points of view and describes more objectively the process of destruction or disintegration of the principal character not her progressive construction, emancipation, and integration as might be expected. In this regard, the trilogy positions the woman hero on a path to destruction. Stylistically, this is achieved by means of loss of speech, a progressive fragmentation of Kate's personality, the annihilation of her intellectual and physical potentialities, and finally her death. Needless to say, the use of two protagonists, one the alter ego of the other, remember Kate and Baba, does not endow the two characters with broad capabilities for negotiation with the world as might be expected. On the contrary, their progressive separation from their physical and ideological roots takes the form of the split subject and attacks the unity of the growing female protagonists. Although this technique allows the expression of a plurality of experiences as well as a set of, uh, as well as a set of obstacles the characters face, it is also necessary, a necessary strategy to express the impossibility of female agency in the post-colonial context of mid-20th century Ireland. As Julia Carlson affirmed, Baba was sex and Kate was romance. So it is my belief that, that this feminine building showman is a unique piece where the real dilemma for the Irish woman of the time is clearly presented. Kate falls victim to insanity and self-destruction after rejecting societal conventions. Baba survives at the cost of accepting subjection to a repressive normality. All these said, I, I cannot but agree with Sinead Mooney, who has declared that the trilogy, quote, exploded the prescribed roles for women in Irish society, predicting at once the way gender roles were constructed in the post independent Ireland, end quote. If the country girls witnessed the closed atmosphere of mid 20th century Ireland for women, the slow turn can be detected by the 1970s when second wave feminism arrived with demands on equality. Uh, they, they were demanding equality, uh, in, in equal pay, uh, equality before the law, um, equal educational opportunities, and contraception, among others. In 1972, we witnessed the publication of the first Commission on the Status of Women. And one year later, Ireland joined the European Economic Community, allowing new opportunities for change. The practice of marriage bar was removed in Ireland only in 1974. Before that time, Article 41 and 45 of the 1937 Constitution had restricted the employment opportunities for women. 
1973, a group of feminists set up the Council for the Status of Women, leading eventually to the establishment of the National Women's Council of Ireland in 1995. Also in 1975, we witnessed the birth of the Irish Women United Group and its magazine, Banshee. As our colleague Marie Margarita Stevens has affirmed, issues of identity and belonging intertwine in a political, social, and economic context, and authors such as Julia Forloin, Jennifer Johnston, Ethan Boland, or Juanita Casey deal openly with female alienation with their sense of displacement, helplessness, and exclusion. Hand in hand, with a stronger sense of identity, legal landmarks, such as the legislation on the Balls in 1996, meant significant advances in the daily lives of Irish women, although their reproductive rights would have to wait much longer. In fact, um, uh, it, it was not until 1993 that um, contraceptives uh, could be bought without prescription in Ireland. All in all, it, it was a time of an extraordinary cultural activism in Ireland, as scholars such as Tina Toole or Gerardin Mimi have demonstrated. But at the turn of the century, globalization and the cultural tidal phenomenon made the country a benchmark for economic success. However, exaltation was soon followed by a collapse and the crisis that unfolded in 2008 unveiled the witnesses of a fragile boom. This led to a financial bailout in 2010 and a subsequent period of austerity only to recover slightly from uh, 2014 onwards. As a response to economic recession, uh, Calvin and Fisher have detected that social movements uh, emerged, uh, such as, for instance, the Irish Feminist Networks that was found, network that was founded in uh, 2010, uh, with aims to mobilize younger women. Uh, many of these movements were uh, quite pro choice uh, groups. Uh, in 2016, abortion became a central issue and a focal point in the general elections, as you well know. And in March 2018, the government announced a referendum and finally uh, the outcome led to the repeal of the Eighth Amendment um, on the 18th of September uh, 2018. At a more general level, cuts to gender equality agencies and public services, as well as in programs supporting women and families, have negatively affected women's collective infrastructure and capacity for agency. In this regard, gender equality coexists with relatively strong feminist political efforts, including energetic protests against the recession's consequences for gender equity. Sociologically speaking, the economic contractions have given way to a repolarization of class and gender, both in discourse and representation, with a very marked regressive orientation. As uh, scholars Free and Scully have detected, this phenomenon is particularly visible in the media, with female bodies frequently identified as commodities and the habits of and, 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 and interests of the wealthy uh, presented as universal. Additionally, sexual behavior has developed as a marker of identity, often a creative with subjection and involving some degree of domination in love sex relations. What is interesting here is that as a response to these major changes, Many Irish authors have been using their art to engage with questions about political agency and subjectivity, providing, quote, a sustained reflection on the precarity of individual life in the face of national and planetary challenges, uh, according to Malcolm Sen. Um, so much affected by the economic upheavals of the last decades, 
they turn to the blatant social and political crisis and how it affects the individuals from a broader scope of global dimensions in what Hegel has called, and I quote, the post-national literature. Uh, more particularly, in an illuminating special issue in contemporary Irish uh, women's, women's writing, uh, Claire Bracken and Tara Harney Mahagan assessed the current moment as a brave and honest platform against the excesses of the Celtic type of woman dust. Anne Enright, Claire Kilroy, Sarah Bourne are just a few well known names whose works illustrate the flourishing years and the devastation of subsequent crops. They will belong to a renaissance of the Irish letters that journalist Justin Jordan has labeled as the post crash stuff of fiction, among which novel author Sally Rooney stands out for her innovative articulation of identity formation in the recessionary climate. Labeled as the Salinger of the Snapchat generation, Rooney is one of those young writers whose work is clearly set in today's Ireland. She writes poetry, essays, and short fiction, but she's best known for her novels, Conversations with Friends and Normal People, which have achieved uh, critical acclaim, and her recently published her novel, Beautiful Word, Where Are You? In fact, it was published uh, this very month, at the beginning of, of September. This 30-year-old author, who is also editor of the literary journal Sting Fly, writes about the lives of young people in Ireland, and her works have been said to present the voice of a generation, the millennials. Today, my focus of interest is normal people, which tells the story of two Irish teenagers, Marianne and Pam, who get involved in a complicated and intermittent sexual and emotional relationship from the school days in a small town into their dynamic and worldly lives at University of Dublin. The novel revolves around the coming of age process of the protagonists to people who strive to fathom the meanings of their lives. Interestingly, Rooney displays this process from a double perspective, as the narration explores the intimate relation between subjects and the political and economic structures that shape the individual subjectivity, the contradictory and changing values that the young generation is forced to contend with are revealed. The plot is close to the building Roman pattern that it expresses the relationship between two young individuals and society. But at the same time, it incorporates its own particularities, inviting the reader to approach it as a variable construction whose literary, literary and social functions change depending on who defines them and when. At the same time, the novel expands into the collective dimension of growing up in a neoliberal context, characterized, as we said before, by commodification and consumerism, liminality and instability, some common features to contemporary Western cultures. So I contend that normal people alters essential elements of the building format to adapt to the current Irish context. Space remains an essential feature in the novel, with the two characters progressive physical distance from their place of origin into the wider world, and their negotiations to gradually achieve social inclusion. But mobility in the physical sense is intertwined with social status, and so the novel accommodates to the post celtic tiger context dominated by precarity and engages with political agency and subjectivity. Hence, normal people necessarily complies with the Irish contemporary context and its building form adopts a more flexible format, stretching and colliding with the normative conventions of the genre and ultimately resulting in a particularly hybrid form. 
The novel is divided into sections that cover a time span of four years from 2011 to 2015. And each section, not chapter, each section is named after the month and the year when the plot takes place to produce a sense of natural chronological advancement in the self-construction process of the two protagonists. But this format, which is close to life writing or diary writing, does not match harmoniously with the building progression. In fact, the sequences unfold with significant time leaps, and the key moments in the plot follow no predetermined advancement. This serves to underline the irregular rhythm of the storyline and to highlight the difficulties encountered in the emancipatory process. Added to this, the present tense dominates the narrative in order to emphasize the immediacy and temporariness of the course of events. This way, in my opinion, the novel highlights the liminal existence of today's Irish youth as, and I quote, a state of in betweenness and ambiguity, and quote, in Beatty's words, and suggests a precarious relation with the future. To all these alterations, normal people reshapes the traditional novel of development and adjusts it to the particular context of recessionary Ireland. Especially interesting is the double perspective achieved through the narrative voices. In this novel, Rooney experiments with Marianne's and Connie's views, devoting separate and random sections to each protagonist. This strategy clearly differs from O'Brien's trilogy, where the main protagonist, Kate, progressively fades away in favor of Baba, her alter ego. In normal people, Marianne and Connell's different but complementary intimate perspectives are present from the beginning in order to enlarge the reader's understanding of the intricacies of growing up in contemporary Ireland. Regarding style, again, realism pervades Rooney's novels. As a dominant form in a contemporary Irish literature, uh, each entry is written in the present tense through an omniscient but intimate narrative voice, which minimizes authorship in favor of fluidity and suggests a certain temporariness, a sense of immediacy that dodges any perspective projection. This focus on interiority is also detected in the absence of quotation marks and dialogues and the narration of introspective moments and scenes that approach the stream of consciousness style. Thematically, normal people concentrates on Marianne and Connie's complicated love sexual relationship. As a millennial novel, it succeeds in projecting an overwhelming sense that the young generation is at a loss in post-crash Ireland trapped between the expectations of the glorious Celtic Tiger era and the austere and self-blaming discourse of recession, they navigate hand in hand in troubled waters. Social inequality, housing problems, consumerism and dysfunctional families pop up throughout the narrative in a hostile context. And the only redemption the author allows her characters is their mutual support. Quite evidently, normal people debunks the ideological construction of the nuclear Catholic Irish family, demonstrating that Connor's single parent and loving mother performs better than Marianne's insensitive mother and abusive brother. That dysfunctional family, a feature in Irish society, as uh, Marisol Morales and Fanelites have uh, detected, plays a dominant role in women. His protagonists. The effects of different family forms and experiences are clearly visible in the protagonists' divergent ties with the hometown and their sense of belonging. So I dare say that Marianne and Connell uh, and Irish Jew to a general extent are governed by external factors that limit their scope of agency. Normal people underscores class and gender 
as the two categories that epitomize the damaging effects of the post-cultural child landscape counteracted solely by their interdependent relationship. Beneath the surface of romance, Rooney explores more deep-rooted forms of conservative ideologies of Chanda linked with materialism. Through displacement of responsibility solely on the individual, personal guilt is fostered and agency is forfeited. Connell suffers from anxiety and depression in an endless effort to succeed socially and economically. The female body and its physical and social subjugation plays a prominent role in, in the narrative, especially because of the explicitness of corporal reality. So the reader learns that Marianne has suffered from physical and psychological violence since her childhood, and even her mother normalizes abusive practices and directs her anger and frustrations at her daughter, blaming her for her suffering. Marianne's pervasive sense of guilt is closely related to humiliation and becomes chronic. Partly as a result of her mother's contempt, Marianne materializes her lack of self-confidence using her body as a site of punishment. Added to that, objectification of the female body becomes a habit during sexual intercourse. Marianne is prone to submission she experiments with vituperation, disdain, and rough sex with her lovers. Her ventures in risky sexual practices include physical violence, choking, and berating, all of which brings her, in the end, little comfort. If the country girls ended with Kate's suicide, in normal people, Marian takes her guilt to the extreme of physical self-annihilation. And I wonder, are these similar forms of redemption? It is my belief that the female protagonists of the two novels under study navigate the narrow margins of the social and sexual condition oscillating between submission and resentment. Nonetheless, O'Brien and Rooney's novels allow a divergent interpretation of their protagonists' behavior. Despite a context where individuation, humiliation, and domination prevail, Rooney succeeds in presenting the essence of identity subject construction in relation with others. The realization of interdependence as a positive element, element comes at the end of the novel, where the growing process is advanced and life experience of the chore brings perspective. In an interview, Rumi defended the essence of identity subject construction as mediated by our relation with others. And I quote, she said, I don't believe, I don't really believe in the idea of the individual. I find myself consistently drawn to writing about intimacy and the way we construct one another. And I quote. So, uh, in my opinion, this understanding of subject construction as a relational entity challenges neoliberal values that advocate for the idealizations of freedom, independence, and autonomy, and situates relationality as the driving force that allows the progression of this novel of formation. By the end of the novel, Marianne, Marianne is able to admit that the benefits of, of their, uh, she's able to admit the benefits of their emotional attachment despite their ups and downs. And uh, I quote, he brought her goodness like a gift and now it belongs to her. They've done a lot of good for each other. Really, she thinks really. People can really change one another, and I quote. These closing lines imply a profound understanding of the individual need of other human beings and interdependence as a positive and enriching means for social integration. Interdependence uh, as the only uh, way to success in the context of post-crash Ireland was not possible in O'Brien's masterpiece. In the 1960s, the path was much narrower for women's emancipatory process, 
and Brian's viewings could only adapt to social standards or perish. So Baba survived and Kate died. In spite of the obvious differences of O'Brien's sequential trilogy and Rooney's normal people, um, uh, both uh, novels portray the difficulties of the emancipatory process in a nation under construction with astonishing coincidences. Each author adapts the novel of formation to her particular time, searching for the most appropriate means to express the challenges for emancipation. The build on format is able to accommodate to the different historical contexts to voice the obstacles and opportunities in the quest for personal fulfillment. Female sexuality and gendered social practices remain problematic issues that these novels account for in the light of their respective legal and social contexts. In both cases, the Irish novel of formation remains a problematic path where emancipation comes at the cost of suffering and abuse. Hence, these novels unsettle traditional paradigms. They venture into formal experimentation and break down on alternative formats. To me, one thing is certain, O'Brien and Rooney's works at the crossroads between innovation and transgression are literary witnesses of the building of the Irish nation from a community perspective. Ireland and Irish literature are in permanent transformation and the novel of formation is a flexible genre that accommodates to the social and political context in continuous development. So uh, I am looking forward to seeing what is to come next. Thank you very much for your attention. Amor, let me wait here for the, the recording. I think it's okay now. Thank you very much for this insightful lecture, Amor. Uh, so now we are going to open the session for questions. Okay. So thank you. Let me hear with my colleagues uh, on YouTube if there are questions. Okay, Amor, while we wait for the, the questions, let me, I have one question. So uh, you were saying about the, the focus on interiority that you mentioned in Sally Rooney's uh, Normal People. Do you think it could be interpreted as a female characteristic in general or of, particularly of the Irish women? Um, you're right, uh, in normal people, interiority is uh, very relevant. The, the focus that really, really places on uh, the inner life and thoughts of the characters is really, uh, you know, extraordinary, very detailed. And um, uh, she expands very much on, she recreates herself in, in you know, uh, inner life. But uh, inner life is very, very much, in my opinion, very much um, intertwined with external uh, factors. Uh, and uh, more than, you know, um, uh, other people's influences, 
I think uh, both characters are very much influenced by the um, social, political, economic, economic situation that they live in, uh, in, 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 as I said before, in a country uh, which uh, has been um, dominated by uh, very um, aggressive upheavals in terms of, you know, recession and uh, before the Celtic Tiger, everything was fantastic. Uh, all of a sudden, it all collapses and the uh, expectations uh, have generated uh, much frustration in, 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 in particular with these characters who are on the brink to, 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 to mature, not, not to maturity, but to adulthood. Um, they, they, they are quite at a loss because they, they don't know what to expect of their future. There is uh, no future. There is uh, what, what what we call um, a liminal situation, an in betweenness. You know, a, a pause in everything that does not allow them to continue. If we translate this to a more international sphere, uh, and uh, I'm thinking now, uh, of course, about Spain, the, the situation of Jew in Spain. I would say it's quite the same, more or less the same because uh, the uncertainties in terms of uh, economy, um, which governs uh, almost everything in our lives, um, is huge. Uh, at the moment, we have almost 50% of uh, unemployment, unemployment rates here in Spain for young people. And um, of course, no prospects, no um, self-assurance or uh, of, of uh, what I'm studying, uh, is it useful uh, to me? Will it be useful to me in the future? Uh, will it be um, uh, rewarded? All my, my um, um, efforts and my strides, will, will they be rewarded? Uh, will, will I enter and uh, join society as a valuable asset? I think that is, uh, as I mentioned very briefly, I think uh, that is a, an international uh, problem, a situation that most Western countries are uh, facing, the, the extreme uncertainty of things and the immediacy of things. So in that sense, uh, what I was trying to, um, to uh, present here is uh, uh, how cleverly, in my opinion, Rooney has um, been able to present the current situation of youth in, in the Irish context, in Ireland, in this case. But uh, of course, it is not something limited to the Irish context. In, in fact, I'm not sure if we can talk about Irishness anymore as something, you know, um, distinctive from other uh, in some aspects, yes, but uh, less and less because of uh, globalization. So, uh, I, I'm not sure if I uh, answered your, your yes, question. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, for sure. So we have lots of questions. So Dr. Giselle Volkov, I will read the questions for you. How about the idea that empowerment proposed by more feminisms hinders freedom and even reproduces all the errors of the male-oriented tradition seen in Irish, yet not restricted to literary representations? Right. Um, I'm not sure if I get the meaning of the question correctly. But um, of course, as, as has been widely um, uh, admitted, uh, feminism is not just one strand. There are many strands of feminism. And uh, of course, uh, there is a huge risk in uh, calling out for feminism in an imitation of the patriarchal errors that you know, uh, have burdened us for centuries. Um, so sometimes feminism uh, offers uh, liberating parts uh, in, uh, for all society, not only for women. Uh, that's at least my, my opinion. Uh, 
uh, a good uh, 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 feminism well understood in my opinion uh, would be a, a feminine that works that walks towards um, not only equality but inclusion and mostly uh, to uh, towards having the person at the center of every action and of every uh, claim if it is not like that we might as the question uh, mentioned uh, reproduce some forms of submission some forms of enslavement that we wanted to abolish so uh yeah uh and it, of course <laughs> it is an enormous challenge because it requires um uh, the the aid of many disciplines and in very different points of view we cannot fall into um, uh, ethnographic or ethno ethnic uh, views of what uh, a liberating feminism could be because um, we are always um, varnished by our own uh, upbringing our own perspectives and the Western world is a very limited um, uh, experience of the world. I mean, uh, uh, globalization has to bring us to many different perspectives to be able to create a more uh, inclusive and comprehensive um, way out of uh, you know, um, oppression. But I, in the end, that is what we are uh, we all want to to get rid of right uh, to all forms of oppression. Okay, thank you. Another question from Giselle: uh, Has feminism gone backwards or in contrary ways as the initial feminist idealisms? Some strands have, yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, I mentioned in my presentation um, there is a study uh, carried out by Freen Scully that absolutely, absolutely um, detects uh, very regressive forms of um, uh, the badly called feminism uh, in, in media representations. And uh, they are very uh, extreme representations of uh, uh, ideal bodies and uh, ideal um, social practices. Uh, and as I mentioned before, um, they in, in, in this case, I think that Rooney also is, is quite correct about that in, in the novel, um, because whether you comply with uh, the ideology, the, the ideology of neoliberalism, where um, material success uh, is the only way uh, to, to enter society, in, in the case of these building novels of formation, let's say, um, uh, and mostly that goes for males and uh, or you comply if you're female with you know um, a body uh, that is uh, as always very well looking is a desirable body but um, uh, who can um, use that body um, irrespectively of any um, ethical consideration, let's say. And, and that is where we, we see uh, many forms of, you know, liberating um, um, sexual practices that might not be that liberating or, uh, it, and it all comes uh, in the end to the, the right to do what I want and that is confused with freedom. Um, it's, it's very complicated, of course, but in the end, I think it all uh, fits very well uh, within the, um, the neoliberal ideologies in which, uh, you know, um, uh, everything is okay as far as um, the, the foundations of the system are not shattered. Uh, so with these guys, uh, freedom and success, in the fold that uh, you know materiality, corporeality uh, that are suggested by this system. This this is more or less what I try. I, I was trying to um, uh, present or in the analysis of uh, Rooney's novel. I think she presents a very very materialistic, a biased 
um, discourse to which the two protagonists are, you know, uh, they cannot escape from it. And uh, that is part of what um, this, uh, I think that is part of what the question uh, meant. Okay. Another question from Giselle uh, regards to reception in Spain. Reception of the works mentioned in the Spanish context nowadays. Hmm. Uh, okay. Um, the Country Dance trilogy never existed for Spanish audiences never existed until, um, I might be wrong, but let me say uh, 2018, I think it was, that uh, the translation into Spanish of The Country Girls was done. Um, and of course, that so many years, so, de so many decades later, um, it has caused no, um, no it's been no scandal and, uh, you know, uh, it has been no, no, not, not really uh, a big event, uh, even though it was very much needed. But uh, you know, Edna Bryan is no, uh, no star here. She is not that well known. Um, only in the last times, with um, uh, the uh, the little chairs, the, uh, not the last but the previous novel that she published, uh, that one has had some uh, acclaim and uh, some good remarks. But for instance, her last novel, uh, Girl, I think it is the title Girl, about uh, um, Nigerian kidnapped uh, girls, uh, which is pretty good. And um, it's, uh, you know, amazing for a woman of her age to, to dare uh, approach the subject. Um, it, it, it has not been uh, a success either. Um, on the contrary, uh, Sally Rooney, her novel is being written, it's being read uh, very much in Spain, but not because of the novel, but because of uh, the TV series, uh, the adaptation into uh, a TV series of the novel, which has been a huge success. Um, the music of the novel has been, uh, of the, of the uh, TV series has been a huge success too, and people are in love with Maria Lincano, but because of the audiovisual, not because of the novel. So people here in Spain first watch it and then maybe read it. Uh, appraisal of the literary mm, quality of the novel has not really transcended. Uh, it is more, you know, the artificial culture that uh, is more successful. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There is a question from Gerson Gonçalves. So uh, he thanks you for the great presentation. And he asks you, and I will read, besides the important role of these writers in the evolution of women's rights, the women movements somehow use these novels to public show uh, the reasons of their claims? Of course, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I, um, let me, let me organize my thoughts. Uh, I personally understand literature, not only as a way of expression, but also as a product of the cultural and um, uh, the cultural moment, these uh, words are being released and also um, as a product of the author's um, personal existence. Okay, it all comes out of, of, of a person's mind. And that outcome uh, is, in my opinion, always mediated by personal and environmental experiences and forces. Um, I'm not saying that all uh, words are political. However, I think all words include political connotations that uh, re reflect um, some um, moments in history. That is why I wanted to link these two novels, which uh, uh, in, in the novel of formation format, in my opinion, mirror some uh, important uh, landmarks 
of Irish history, not really specifically and openly, but they are the product of a writer's personal experience and they are the product of the influences that writer has had. So uh, it, in my opinion, it is inevitable that um, they have to be read, particularly, uh, I'm not referring to historic novels and so, but uh, to realistic uh, um, novels. They, they inevitably uh, have uh, con uh, social, political, economic connotations embedded in, in, the, in the literary product uh, of that. That, uh, yeah, that I believe, and um, uh, of course we can discuss this because this is a very subjective opinion. But uh, I, I, in fact, I enjoy and I, I like to read words through that perspective because I think they are more enriching and they help me, they help us understand much better what lies behind the just the literary expression. There is so much behind in terms of uh, social values, cultural values and perspectives. Thank you. And from Bruce Stewart, is it worrying that Sally Rooney is often called a pop writer? Well, that is an aspect in Rooney's works that I haven't mentioned. Um, but uh, and, and, and it might be related to uh, to her being labeled a millennial novelist. Um, well, um, and in her uh, three novels so far, she uh, uses uh, makes use of um, digital channels uh, of uh, computers, the internet, and uh, you know. Um, uh, common devices, uh, and she includes them as part of her, um, of her artistic work. And that is something uh, that we haven't seen uh, so far in, in Irish literature, how a writer is able to create um, a literary product using you know the text of an email or 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 the uh, whatsapp message uh, as part of that literary form of expression i think she that she she, uh, she does it quite well quite naturally and in that sense i think she well uh, might be called a pop author um because not only because of that, but because she also tackles aspects of um, um, of a daily life experience of young people that are not normally um, um, explored in a very natural way. Um, and all her novels, it's true, they uh, have a, a hint of romance that, uh, you know, garnishes her works. But below, underneath the, the romance of her novels, which m might make her words look like something light and uh, a bit chick lit, um, I think there is much uh, to... to you know, to excavate uh, and, and to, to bring out to light that gives us many, many um, hints of uh, how contemporary youth is facing the moment and uh, how they have in some ways broken completely with the past, with um, myths and topics uh, that used to work in the past but they are non-existent anymore. Uh, for instance, faith and the religious um, act are totally missing from her novels. And that is something that could not have been understood in, in O'Brien's times, could have not be, been conceived in O'Brien's times. So um, uh, I think it's interesting to, to have a look at, at her works in that way, how things uh, have changed 
and um, what is not working anymore and what has come out as a new means of expression. Okay, so now we have a question from, thank you, Amor. We have a question from Mariana Bofarini, and I will read. Thank you for your elucidating talk. Mariani's sexuality can be controversial. At the same time, as the novel is open to different manifestations of sexuality, such as Sado Mazo, at the end of the day, Mariani is clearly hurt. I would like to know your opinion on this issue. Yes, yes, of course. I totally agree. Um, she is, uh, be before, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, before um, uh, be before the novel starts, Mariana Marianne is already um, um, hurt. She has suffered from uh, abuse in her family for long, and uh, um, in that sense, she's already hurt. And she is uh, particularly hurt um, psychologically. She is insecure despite her, you know, um, her uh, attitude. And um, she's insecure, and she manifests her uh, her her um, space for agency through her body. So uh, she concentrates, let's say, or the novel concentrates on uh, the sexual uh, behavior, her sexual behavior, as a means to uh, comply and challenge. Uh, no, uh, she uh, she is not steady. She varies her her uh, attitude and her behavior um, in in terms of sexuality. So, uh, with most of her sexual partners, um, she uh, she uh, plays the submissive role, and even she plays, you know, yeah, as you said, with uh, masochism and um, vituperation. And uh, but in the end, uh, at several parts in the novel, um, she admits that it gives her no satisfaction in the end, that it, it, it does not take her out of the hole she is in. And the only way, which I think is one of the um, great achievements of, of Rooney here, and the only way that she can um, begin to see the light and, um, and have a healthy sexual relationship is through Connell. The, their relationship uh, is what gives both of them strength and the minimal security to go on, to enter the world. Even in, in the end of the book, they, they take a big part, they take a different ways, and um, they separate in good terms, but they admit that their relation has been a positive influence for their growing up process and um, for their ultimate inclusion insertion in society. So um, yeah, um, and in that sense, um, she she reflects also the materiality and corporeality of the current times, where everything is disposable, uh, even your own body. And a body, she at, at a certain moment in the novel, she says feels like a carcass I have to carry. And she's tired of carrying that carcass. So uh, this makes us think how sad it is that a young woman with a beautiful growing body is tired of it. I mean, um, it's really sad. And uh, it's a sign of the times that we live in too. Okay. Maria Amor, it was a great pleasure to have you here in this plenary session. Unfortunately, the, the time's up and we have to end the session now. But thank you very much in name of, in name of the, the organization of the symposium. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you all very much. It's been a pleasure. Good. Thank you.